Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this Monday night, May 22nd, in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. One of the first things I wanted to talk about was uh, the recent frost events we saw last week. So I went back and I made a graphic that goes from the 12th of May all the way to the 21st and looks at anywhere in gray here where the temperatures got to 33 degrees or colder according to the RTMA data. Now, this is not going to capture every single event. It's designed just to kind of give us an overview of where we saw that uh, the colder air, like here and throughout much of the Northeast, getting back into this part of the Eastern Corn Belt, here into parts of Michigan and Northern Wisconsin. And then, as we talked about last week, the frost event that did come through parts of this section of uh, Montana, North Dakota, and patches in sections of um, South Dakota. Uh, but I have received reports from some of you suggesting that there was frosts in um, western uh, Nebraska as well in some isolated locations. So I just wanted to show you what the official kind of data is when we look at the uh, RTMA. Now from here, let's go ahead and take a look at what the temperatures have done so far in the month of May. Because of the large ridge that's set up here over the western parts of Canada, that's one that's been pushing uh, the very hot, dry conditions that have developed those fires in western Canada. Uh, we've seen just incredibly hot conditions up until this past weekend for the Pacific Northwest. So uh, up to this point, just notice that every climate reporting district in um, Washington state is currently having its hottest May on record, even though the temperature have finally broken away. So these numbers are going to start to come back down. What will be changing is the central part of, of the United States. This will be an area that's going to pick up quite a bit of heat very soon. And we are going to push some of that heat at times even a little bit farther to the east. I'll show you that in just a few moments. But just a quick comment on those fires. This is what the uh, current satellite data looks like here on Monday afternoon. We can still see a lot of wild, smir uh, wild fire smoke excuse me, uh, throughout the Canadian prairie and down throughout much of the central United States, the Midwest, and all the way to the east. And uh, this is just showing that those fires um, were quite extensive and, and put a lot of smoke into the atmosphere that we're still dealing with. The good news is the shortwave that moved into the Pacific Northwest over the weekend, that was the one that kicked off those severe storms here, is still spinning and delivering some rain to this area. So we've got cloud cover, we've got moisture coming in, and that's good. A lot of storms popping already in the mountains today, and we are watching a couple of very interesting areas of low pressure. There's one actually spinning over the Colorado Rockies here, and a second one that's out in the plains. We're just going to continue to keep an eye. In fact, this is going to be an area that we're going to see quite a bit of thunderstorm activity in over the coming uh, probably the next 10 to 15 plus days and as you know this is a region that is deep in drought and we're going to continue to uh, kind of work against that drought going forward i'm also going to be watching florida very carefully given the upper level height pattern and systems especially later this week that could move out of florida and georgia and clip parts of the mid-atlantic later on now more on that in just a few seconds what i want to get to next is what the month of may has given us in terms of precip stats now this is kind of a, you know, a lower resolution view of things because we're resampling the data within each climate reporting district. But notice how wet it's been in parts of western Nebraska, Colorado, western sides of Kansas, down into New Mexico and Texas, a lot of thunderstorm activity. Been a few pockets that have been wet around that, but there are also holes in this. And we can see dryness in parts of Wyoming and Utah. Notice right into parts of Missouri, this side of Nebraska, very dry. Kansas, pockets throughout Illinois, and then notice lower Michigan, extremely dry. Parts of uh, you know the upper Midwest, very, uh, very dry. And then this spot over here into um, parts of, um, excuse me, North Carolina, Virginia, and then up toward Pennsylvania. Now that's not to leave anybody out of the discussion, but uh, I was just trying to identify these areas. And another way I like to look at it is this map. I show it to you all the time, but it's, it's one of my favorites here. Last 30 days percent of normal precipitation. So we took a good look at this this morning, but just to show you how deep that drought area is right here, uh, just south and along I-80, or for example, here across Missouri and Iowa, getting into lower Michigan, and then just pockets in the upper uh, Midwest. So when we are assessing what this upcoming pattern is going to do, this is the backdrop to all of this. All right, this is what we're going to be comparing against. And I think the most important thing about this pattern, all right, is what the flow is up to. And the flow is retracted and it is slow. So this is a great website put together at uh, State University of New York at Albany. And uh, what it's showing you here is these four quadrants on where the position of the jet stream could be. I've shown it to you in the past. If you have a jet extension, that means the jet's coming all the way across the Pacific like this. If it's poleward, it's here. If it's equatorward, it's there. And if it's retracted, it's just doing that. So what we've got is a retracted jet. So that means that a lot of this part of the Pacific getting into North America is going to have weaker upper level flow. And to 
you know, the very basics of how the atmosphere is going to behave is the speed of the upper level winds, which is determined by the, uh, the temperature gradient in the lower levels, all right? The speed of the upper level winds ultimately creates and destroys these high and low pressure systems that give us precipitation and move weather forward. So what we've got right now is that as we play out through the rest of this week, getting out there to Friday and to Saturday, now the ensemble, what it does is it tends to just average out some of the bigger features. And by the time we get out here to June 1st, this is your retracted jet. There's a subtropical component here that's going to be interesting for Texas, that's going to be interesting for California, and that's going to be interesting for Florida. But notice for much of the Canadian prairie, much of the United States, the flow is just weak. All of the momentum in the atmosphere seems to be transferred right now to the southern hemisphere. And this weakened jet seems to be around all the way to like June 5th, 6th, maybe even the 7th, which means the front half of this forecast I'm about to give to you will likely be a condition we'll be dealing with not only for the remainder of May, but that first full week of June as well. And we just see here very strong winds in the southern hemisphere, very weak in the northern hemisphere. Now we expect this when we get into full-blown summer, but we're not there yet. We're still a month away from the solstice. So we're watching this, uh, this carefully. This is what is currently driving our pattern. Now, if I trace it out, there seems to be general troughs off the west coast and a ridge that pops up over the mountains and then runs like this toward um, you know, the east coast. So there's ridging that's just here uh, on, the, on the plains. And what that has done, or at least what I can correlate that to, is that we watched the MJO sweep around and get stalled out right over here in phase seven. And it seems as though we're going to see a connection with phase seven for the end of May. What will be important to know is if this MJO can just break away from this and get moving once again. We're going to continue to analyze that all week, and I'll be sure to report it back to you. But as it stands historically, if the MJO is in phase seven and it's in May, we tend to have troughing here and a ridge that extends over the Rockies and troughing over the east. So the reminder here is that it is still spring. So if you're in the midsection of the country and you have flow like this, we tend to get convergence aloft, drier conditions. We don't have the summer heat or the summer moisture in place to pop storms on northwest flow. That's a July and August feature, all right? What it means for the west is uh, a lack of, of major heat. We get flow comes out of the southwest, which means the mountains are going to pop with storms. Not like they do when there's a monsoon going, but when they, uh, uh, but like they can with just southwest flow in spring. And this also means that possibly the southeast is going to stay wetter and cooler out of this pattern, too. So I can really see the, the parallels with MGO phase 7, although I don't think it's the most dominant teleconnection. But we boil all this down and start to pick apart the pieces, and I want to tell you something I'll be watching for. This is a forecast for the Pacific North American pattern. And in a nutshell, when it's very positive, there's a big ridge over the west. When it's negative, there's a trough there. And you see that we are going into negative territory all the way to start the month of June and may not return toward positive territory with the ridges until after the 5th or 6th. Now that means that the rest of May through the first full week of June, the pattern of what we're explaining is going to be around and may not be able to shift around until after that first full week of June, maybe even later than that. And what it looks like is something like this. So for the next 10 days, and that gets us out there um, you know, through June the 1st, we see uh, that the, the, the precipitation pattern is wet here. This is right now. Lots of storms coming through this section of the west and then very wet here in the plains, right on top of our drought area. Storms likely increasing the farther north you get into the Canadian prairie as well. Wherever you see the white, those are the really dry areas. Now remember, I said that subtropical jet's going to also be playing a role in some low pressure developing here over Florida. So that's why Florida, parts of Alabama, Georgia, and then maybe up the Carolina coast into Virginia, we could see some wetter conditions here. But why don't we step this up to the chance of getting two inches? I mean, look at that. That is a bullseye on one of the driest spots in the country compared to average, bringing in some decent precipitation. And let's also go on the other side of this. What's the probability of getting less than, whoops, let me flip that over. Here it is, less than a half inch. And now you see that the Midwest is going to be targeted for very dry conditions. It's common down here in the Southwest and in California and the Columbia Basin to be this dry in early June. It's usually only, you know, scattered storms that can come through and deliver decent precip to those three areas. But it's quite dry here, okay? So thinking about this, knowing what the temperatures are going to do, which I'll show you in a few moments, I'm concerned about the um, how long this pattern lasts and what it might do to evaporation rates and things like that. 
because you go out here into the week two forecasting, these are all the 12Z updates, we see that uh, this area stays drier. So that's where the pattern, you know, potentially breaking is going to have to start to move and shift and get out. And it's interesting because the same pattern we're in now, if we saw that in July and August, we'd be talking about more routine thunderstorm activity. But as it stands, it's it's a drier look. So again, CPC, uh, European model, ensemble, GFS ensemble. You can see all three are wet in the same spots. Okay, what about the temperature pattern? Well, this is that five-day sliding window of average temperature anomalies. And again, like I've been stressing for the last three videos, our biggest problem is starting the month of June, we're colder than average south and warmer than average north, which means the temperature gradient is negligible. It's small. It's very small. And therefore, there's no reason for the jet stream winds. This is all through the thermal wind relationship. There's no reason for the jet stream to even exist over this. So it's not. And that needs to change in order for this whole pattern to change and bring back in better flow at some point in June. Now, I say that letting you know that once you get into July, this doesn't matter as much. August, it doesn't matter as much either. It's here in June that it's most critical to have that strong temperature contrast because we are still in the spring precipitation regime. All right. Now, showing you the warm temperatures here, I'm going to come back to that discussion I brought up a moment ago about evaporation. We see that through the next week, we might have up to an inch and a half to two inches of evaporation here. Now, that is if you have the moisture to evaporate, but that tells us the heat is coming into the western corn belt while it's going to remain very wet right in through this area. So that's our current setup as it stands for the next couple of weeks on temperature and precip. What I'm concerned about is the soil moisture. Now, I normally don't show you this soil moisture map from the CPC because I like to show you the one from NASA. Uh, but I contacted NASA today about it because their maps have been down since the 18th. And they just said they lost a server. Uh, they're getting a new one. It should be replaced tomorrow, which means we'll get back into those maps. But as it stands, the CPC does have a lack of soil moisture in this area. It extends into Illinois and Indiana. It's over here. It's also in parts of the Carolinas and down into Texas. So when we see this, we know that we may not be able to achieve those evaporation rates because of a lack of moisture in the soil or a lack of moisture in the newly grown vegetation. Now, I want to put all this into broader context, and I want to just let you know what I've been thinking about with this pattern overall. So uh, this is not just to single out one area, but over the weekend, I received dozens of emails and phone calls and text messages, primarily from people in the Corn Belt. And I think the reason for those questions was just because this is an area that's expected to be quite dry going forward. So let's start to address some of those questions. When you look back historically at June precipitation, we want to find what makes it wet. What does it take to get the moisture to come back? And I imagine you've already stitched this together in your head. You've got to get the jet stream winds to come back, which means you need the contrast. So you look during that time period, and we look up there at the 500 millibar heights. The blues are troughs of cold air. The reds are ridges of warm air. See, we've got the heat down south, the cold up north, and the jet stream will just run in between it, just like that, and it'll move. And a ridge over the southeast is a pump. It just puts the moisture into place in spring, and it delivers. This is the 20 wettest Junes I've got going back to 1960, and that's what they all did. They all had some flavor of this. And you can pause it look at the years down there if you'd like to. It also helps if the MJO spends more time right over here, somewhere in phases like 4, 5, and 6, not necessarily over the Pacific and certainly not back in phase 1, but somewhere in here, a preference to be rising motion there. You say, well, why? If this is where the MJO lives, it enhances the jet coming off of Japan. And instead of leaving it retracted, it tends to extend it a bit more and push it across the open Pacific Ocean. That's one component of this analysis. But then you say, well, what about those years? What about El Nino La Nina? And I'll tell you, the correlations aren't very strong. So you look at this and you're like, wait a minute, I see cooler water there. I said, I, I know that, but it's position plus what's going on in the North Pacific and North Atlantic. These years displayed a wide variety of ocean temperature patterns to give us what we learned about the June precipitation and, its, and, and the jet stream flow. So we can't rest our hat in June on what's going on with El Nino. And that's typically because El Ninos and La Ninas tend to have their greatest impacts on the... Uh, I don't know what you want to call it, like the seasonal peak, so summer and winter, not the transition seasons like spring and fall. And we're in spring right now, so we have to understand that that is a component here that's not being captured. 
But I want to talk about what's going on right now with these features because our latest ocean temperature graphic, remember, this is our one major preseason clue as to what summer could be. And what we've watched is a lot of warm water build into the North Pacific. It's now cut away at the negative PDO signal that was here. A month ago, all of this was cold west or east of that line, and now it's all gone over warm. We still have this, that negative, southern negative PDO piece, but El Nino is trying to creep in and warm that up. And El Nino just continues to be quite aggressive in the way that it's developing. At the end of this briefing, I got to talk to you about what's going on over here in the, um, you know, in this part of the Atlantic Ocean where the temperatures are very, very, um, very mild right now for this time of year. So let's review this. What do we know? I'm going to show you the forecasts from other forecasting agencies. Then we'll do some analogs and try to put this all together. This is the latest update from uh, the CPC. They put this out on the 18th. We talked about it last week and, and talked about it again this morning. But overall, you notice that their precipitation pattern is not picking up on the same consistent dry signal lasting all of the month of June here where it is right now. We know that the European model did. And I'm waiting to get the latest update on this a little bit later this afternoon, and I'll be sure to put that in my report tomorrow morning. But, uh, you know, I don't expect it to look any different from this for the forecast for June because it'll continue to be initialized dry and also warm in this area. So we come back here and just say, all right, that's what the CFS, or excuse me, that's what the CPC did. Now, what about the CFS V2? Now, I do not ever look at a single run of the CFS V2. I find it to be too highly variable. But what I do with the CFS V2 is when I see it put together three or four or five runs in a row that show the same pattern, then we start to look for that trend. And what I've noticed is for this June 5th to July, June 11th, excuse me, it's tried to bring in a bit more moisture into this area, kicking out the dryness there, and then by mid-June, open it all back up to a lot of thunderstorm activity, making the Canadian prairie showing up with a little bit drier of a signal. Now, it did this all weekend long, which is why I'm showing it to you today. And I want to know, is this something we should expect in June, given, as I just mentioned, that we have this, uh, you know, El Nino brewing, this weakening PDO signal, and what's, you know, very, very warm temperatures out here in the Atlantic. So let's do some sea surface temperature analysis, because the top question I was asked over the last four days is, as soon as this dry forecast came out for the Midwest, the questions are, does it look like 2012? So here's my first answer. Not really. Now you say, what, what's different? Okay, here's 2023 on May 21st. Here's 2012 on May 22nd. Now what was the big difference? The PDO signal was incredible. All of that cold water there, that's one of the strongest, you know, May, June, July PDO signals we, we've kind of had. And this water here was confined right over you know, between uh, uh, Hawaii and the Aleutian Islands. So you know what happened? The ridge set right there. And because of the wavelength of our trough ridge pattern in summer, if there's a ridge here, there'll be another ridge right there. And there'll be another one over here. It's that triple ridge setup. Now, we don't have this. We've already seen the erosion of the cold water here. What that might do is that might push the ridge farther away from this part of the Pacific there. And that tends to give us more of that positive PNA pattern and northwest flow across the Midwest, across the Corn Belt that's dry now. That's later. That's that's July and that's August. Next, I, I I'm still trying to figure out if I'm wise in saying that we look more like 2009, because in 2009 this was all warming up and pushing into these areas. We still had the cold water here, but El Nino was growing. This doesn't look anything like this year. In fact, it's kind of crazy to say this. But the differences in 2009 for the Midwest, for the Corn Belt, and what happened in 2012, in the ocean temperatures, they aren't that far off. The difference was huge for the precipitation pattern in yields. And I think right now I'd lean more toward a 2009 analog than anything else. Now, telling you that, I want to let you know that in June of 2009, we had ridging here and troughs off the West Coast, ridging in the midsection of the country in a trough east. And it started off that way, giving us a drier signal in the midsection of the United States. But it did not finish that way. What we ended up getting here was drier a little bit to the north, very much dry down here to the south, and a wet corridor tucked in between. And that made it all the way to New England. 
So this is kind of what the CPC might be discussing going forward. Because you notice, if you go back to their forecast, where was that? Uh, here, that they've got this area showing up wetter, but they've given equal chances to this, despite it being drier over the next 10 to 15 days in this area. So I'm starting to think that they are picking up on this potential shift overall. I also want to point out that they released this. Now, this is going to be updated later today, but they actually had some more of that wetter risk trying to get its way into the Western Corn Belt at the beginning of June. We'll see what they update this with later today. I imagine they're going to go back over drier. But coming back to this discussion, we need to know that 2009, if that's a strong analog year, we could start to deliver some storms into this area quite soon. I do not want to see this. About the only good thing though right now is down here across our cotton belt. We got peanuts down here, corn, soy, we got everything growing down here. Is that as of late, we've actually had decent moisture except right along the Mississippi. Outside of it, there's been good storms. There's only very small pockets of dryness. So just keep that in the back of your mind as you go forward. Now, I keep talking about El Nino and its speed of development. So why don't we just quickly do this? If we look at the Junes of every time we came out of either a week, any kind of La Nina into El Nino, I just picked them all out here. This is what I found. These are the Junes for all of the times going back to the 1950s of when we had in a La Nina winter into an El Nino spring. And they were dry in this corridor through June. They are actually wet where we're wet right now. This is going to be the wild card to see if that manifests itself. But just note that El Nino Junes are not wet on average. So we see that right in through here. So that just kind of gives us some context that if El Nino becomes the dominant kind of player in all of this, we should expect them to go into July with more storms. And that's what it does. Okay, you go from a drier June to a wetter July. Now, I want to review with you again the long range models. This is the June, July, August forecast from the European model. Okay. This is the June, July, August forecast from the CPC, or, uh, excuse me, from the National Multimodel Ensemble. Again, greens are wet. These colors represent dry. And this is what our own government is saying about June, July, August. We do see a lot of um, similarities in these forecasts, but I'm just going to make, I'm going to put a line in the sand here and tell you something. The next 30 days, so let's call that June 20th or June 21st, the solstice, all right? That will be the most deciding and most important factor for this upcoming growing season. If the wet conditions are able to return to the midsection of the country after the first week of June, then we have better signals that El Nino is in fact running the, the show. If not, I cannot attribute it to the negative PDO. That's not it. I can only attribute it to the loss of momentum because of how warm the whole of the northern hemisphere is. It's just too warm. We have so much heat that there is not a strong enough temperature gradient to drive the jet stream. So June 20th or June 21st, that's going to be the date by which I think we're going to have a solid signal about what the remainder of summer is going to give us. So that's it. The next 30 days are your most critical to watch. Last thing I want to show you is, uh, is this. Okay, Remember I showed this to you earlier. This is a statistical approach to the longer range forecast. And I just want to make another point here that the model right now is not overly confident on developing drought or keeping things wet in the United States. Where it is dry, South America, Indonesia, the Philippines. Not so much in the North China Plain or the Manchurian Plain. There could be issues with the Indian monsoon because the Indian Ocean Dipole is going positive. Don't see any major stresses for Europe either. So I just want to bring that up as one last point. To finish... This will maybe be the most important map I'm going to watch throughout the month of June. It is very warm here. In fact, to show you how warm it is in the tropical Atlantic, including the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, this is what the tropical Atlantic sea surface temperatures look like right now. Now, normally they're coldest in mid-February, and then they're warmest in October. And right now we're on this upward trend. Where we currently sit is more than a half degree Celsius above normal, and that's huge is the total span of ocean temperatures in the tropical Atlantic is on average about 2 degrees C. So what does this mean? Does this affect the position and strength of the Bermuda high? Does this affect the heat and moisture transport of the lower atmosphere? How does that affect and move into the United States? All of these are unknowns. That's the wild card. This is my wild card. Not the PDO, not the El Nino. It's this right here. 
And also, what does this do to the upcoming hurricane season? And before I wrap this up, I do want to note, look at the interaction here, where we must be getting some upwelling along the Gulf Stream. That's really kind of fascinating to see. All right, I will just keep monitoring this, and I will report back to you again, and uh, we'll talk more on it soon. But the next 30 days, I think, are the most critical for determining what this summer is going to hold for us. Thanks.